What is up guys, in today's video we are going to look at some 200 NL fast fold hands played by one of my most prolific students. This is a professional poker player who came to me to tighten up some of the holes in his game a few months ago when he hired me for coaching. His graph looked like this, not his overall graph because he'd been playing professionally for years, but he'd been going through a bit of a torrid time, running bad, playing his sort of C game or D game and just really losing connection with his best poker. He just couldn't find that optimal winning professional version of himself so we did a bit of mental game work we did a bit of technical game work we just sort of tightened up a lot of the leaks in his game and got him back to firing on all cylinders i'm pleased to report that he sent me this graph today which is basically what's happened over the last 70k hands or something like that and yeah things have really turned around now obviously there's likely variance involved here you don't have a graph like this as a solid poker player unless you're running bad and equally you don't have a graph like this unless you're running good but what we need to understand about variance is that it's not everything. We shouldn't hide behind it and say, oh, woe is me, I'm just running bad. And in fairness to this player, despite the fact he'd been playing professionally for a very long time and supporting a family and using poker as his sole means of income and was incredibly experienced, he still had the humbleness and the self-awareness to hire a coach and get to work on what needed to be done. So yeah, I'm really thrilled. I love it when people send me graphs like this. This player is very solid. You're going to see this today as we go through his hands. But let's get started. We're going to talk about whether to bluff this river with Queen Jack. This player does not make a ton of mistakes, and this will be a good demonstration of just how you should play in a game like this. But first, before we get into the action, decide whether to bluff off in this river spot. Quick announcement, two days from now on Friday the 7th of April, there is a site-wide Easter sale going on at CarrotCorner.com. All of our courses and other products are 25% off apart from private coaching. That's the only thing that is excluded. Head on over to CarrotCorner.com. Check out our Easter sale. Now is the time to invest in your poker education. Now let's get into the nitty gritty of these 200 NL spots and see what we can learn from these fascinating situations. So these are actually hands that came up during a coaching session that the student and I had yesterday morning. I marked them as we were going through with his permission and said I was going to make a YouTube video out of this. So these are all really hand selected, important spots for your game. I think these are spots where many of you guys will be making mistakes. So let's jump right in. We have Queen Jack of Hearts here in the small bind. We go for a three bet against under the gun opener, which seems totally solid. Also completely fine to roll a bit of call into your strategy here. And it's definitely a bit more defensible to call against early position from the small blind than it is against the button, for example. Villain makes the call and we have a flop of king 5-4, so this is an incredibly good board for a range, very high EV. The 5 and the 4 are likely to miss a lot of the pocket pairs under the gun actually opens and calls a 3-bet with here, although they may have 4s from time to time and probably 5s most of the time. They're not going to have those hands pure or as pure as they would have a hand like 9s or 8s here. So the king is obviously much better for us. We're going to start with a lot of c-betting here. When the board is good for you, what happens is that if you check... Your opponent's incentivized to check back a lot, so you just really miss the opportunity to build the pot with a range advantage and also fail to capitalize on an abundance of fold equity which exists here, and that's very useful for not just your bluffs but some of your more vulnerable made hands like pocket nines as well. So we go for the small bet and villain calls. The eight of spades, we have one of the worst hands in our range to actually barrel with here. The problem here is that if you imagine what villain is calling and then folding on the turn, so calling flop and folding turn, if you try and picture that absolute weakest part of this player's range, it's going to be stuff like Queen Jack of Hearts, Queen Ten of Hearts, Ace Jack of Hearts, Ace Queen of Hearts. The back door, basically. The two-tone board is a really striking thing under the gun against small blind because under the gun mainly has suited big cards, right? Not offsuit big cards, like they would have a bit more in small blind or button later configurations. So that means that when they call the flop with an unpaired hand, they almost always have either hearts or clubs. Sometimes they have a hand like ace-queen off with one club, but even that could be folding pre-flop in such a tight configuration. This means that this hand is going to heavily block the folding range of the opponent, unblocking the continues. And while it does have a few live pair outs against things like eights or nines or tens, this is for all purposes just a give up and the student does find the give up here. On the river, the king of spades... This is a spot that many of you will absolutely butcher and get eaten alive and you'll get absolutely destroyed here by the stronger players in your pool if you're not careful. So this is a spot where you actually arrive with a fairly large range disadvantage. This is what happens when you make a c-bet unselectively with lots of stuff in your range and your opponent calls even though they were folding really frequently. So because this board was good for you, you c-bet a lot, but then Villain was very selective about what they continued. Their range moved massively towards things like flush draws, king x, showdown value, under pair, and away from hands like the queen ten of diamonds, which you could have at a really high frequency still. 
So this is a spot where you have to be super selective. When you have hearts, it's just a minus EV river bluff. Like you shouldn't be taking this spot in GTO terms. If someone was really overfolding to bet check bet in these positions, you could take this bluffing spot. But that's not the case. Mass data basically assures us that this is not an overfolded node of the game tree. So this is just for all intents and purposes a give up. Student finds the give up. If you're not careful here, the reason I say that many of you may get massacred against strong players here if you're not careful is that if you start bluffing willy nilly or you have a thought process that goes, I don't have showdown value, therefore I have to bluff, what you're actually going to do is you're running into the burning building to get your phone. You're going to get burned alive. The idea is, no, you can't get your phone back out of your house when it's on fire unless you go into the house, but that doesn't mean you should go into the house. This analogy here relates to the decision point of whether you should bluff the river. It's the only way you can win the pot. Clearly, you never chop or win by checking, but that doesn't mean that you should do it, especially not with negative blockers in an unfavorable world for your range. These are all carrot poker skill concepts, guys. You can check out the carrot poker skill, of course, at carrotcorner.com. It is a thorough academic cash game course that talks about all of this theory stuff. So we give up, we face a bet, we fold. Lovely stuff, well played hand by a hero. Sometimes the best you can do is make a C bet and then check fold the turn and check fold the river. Isn't poker fun? Ace Queen offsuit here, we go for a three bet, cutoff versus hijack. Villain calls, we get a flop of King Deuce 5. This is again another favorable world for range, doing a lot of betting here. I won't go into detail because we've already talked about this. This is a spot that I kind of quibbled with the student a little bit in. He elects to fold here, and this isn't a terrible play, and I think he had some kind of read that this was like a random aggro whale that was just going to pile money into the pot on the turn, so he probably quite rightly concluded here that his realizability, which is a key concept for, again, from the carrot poker school, realizability is very, very low here, and if you peel this raise against someone who's over-aggressing turn, you either have to like close your eyes and start calling down ace-queen, which is not really the right hand to close your eyes and call down with against an aggro maniac because they could just have fours or something or ace five and just be losing it with the middle of their range and committing all sorts of weird polarization mistakes. So if I had jacks here, I think like calling and just calling down and closing your eyes is pretty good. Ace queen is probably a fold against this player. I thought at the time of this that this would be close to break even as a call here, but the solver actually returned an interesting verdict, which is that call with the ace of spades is clearly winning. If you have the Queen of Spades instead, your hand performs a bit less well as a call, and just raising with that blocker to fill in shoving range and general raise continue range is going to be preferable. So with Ace of Diamonds, Queen of Spades, this is actually a pure raise, and with Ace of Spades, Queen of Diamonds, it's a pure call. You can only fold here if you don't have a spade. Isn't poker hard? Sometimes you actually have to defend with hands that don't look like defense at all. Interesting spot. 3-4 now in the big blind, we have an open from under the gun, and of course we make the call here. 3-betting this hand, it's a little bit iffy, it's slightly too low down to 3-bet at much of a frequency, though I doubt there's a big EV loss if you were to mix it in at a very low frequency. You'd have to be careful you didn't overcook the bluffing broth there, though very easy to boil over with respect to your bluff-to-value ratio if you bluff too often. 3-jack ace with 2 diamonds, we go for a check. This is absolutely one of the hands we can raise at the highest frequency basically permissible with our bluffing range. The idea here is that when you raise, you get useful fold equity. If villain folds something like 10-9, well, they folded two over cards. If they fold something like a gutter, if you go big here, they folded even more outs. And of course, you can also backdoor your way into two pair of trips and win a really nice pot. Both your four and your three are going to be relatively live, especially the latter against villain's bet call range on this flop. So this is what we would call a hybrid bluff. It's a hybrid in the sense that you get called by some hands you're doing okay against, you have value to improve later and win big pots, you have useful fold equity, so that's the denial or protection part, and then you also have like the bluff element in that villain can just fold hands that are simply better than you in crushing you like pocket sixes, pocket sevens, pocket nines, etc. So very, very clear call or raise mix, and I would raise this really frequently. The student goes for a call in this case, which again is fine, it's not a problem, but you would want to mix quite a lot of raise here. Three on the turn, hallelujah, this is an amazing card. However, it's not really that relevant to our range. The reason that we don't really smash the three like we smash a card like a jack is that the three is actually kind of non-existent pre-flop. It's really combinatorically not a large part of our range. However, the jack, on the other hand, is going to be a card we have all the time pre. We don't really raise it much on the flop, although you'd be surprised GTO is a weird thing. But with the three on the flop, we're raising a lot, so the hand has just gone from our range pretty frequently. 
So yeah, three four of spades, one of our only three X combos. Going to keep checking here, that would be the play. Obviously looking at check raising this pure if we face a bet. This is an incredibly strong value hand that has the urgency to rush the pot growth and really like pile a bunch of chips in there if we do face something like a pot sized or 75% pot sized turn C bet. Villain checks back, we land on the river. At this point in the hand, we really need to ask ourselves, what is our equity like? Is it enough to value bet? And if so, is it for, you know, what size of value bet are we going to use? Clearly, the answer to this is yes, this is enough equity to value bet. If I had to take a guess at how much equity we had here, I would say against Villain's range, it's probably in the 80s comfortably. What that means is if we're in the sort of low to mid 80s in terms of equity is that we can use a sizing like pot or b75 or b80 something around this vicinity you don't really want to be going to x pot unless you've got about 90 percent equity to that's landing equity starting equity on this node obviously when you do bet and get called your equity is going to go down and at that point your target is to have just more than 50 percent against villains continuing range although take that with a pinch of salt because we also need to factor in getting raised and stuff like that so villain goes for the b75 which is absolutely right you wouldn't really want to check here and the reason for that is that because villain just has a lot of hands like king high pocket pair ace x here they have a very condensed range that's going to check back really frequently with this hand you are unblocking a lot of the ace x villain can have which is of course what you're trying to get called by here you could also get called by some other bluff catchers at a low frequency though as well if they don't block your bluffs so for example if villain had pocket eights or pocket sevens here I think it's pretty reasonable for them to mix call here, but something like pocket queens would just block a lot of your bluffs or pocket tens, and that would likely be a pure fold. So we go for this play, villain goes away, really well chosen sizing. What Hero's done well here is identified his equity category and bet a size that's justified by that. On to pocket nines now, we're on the button, we go for a cold call this time, you could also three bet, it doesn't really matter, we go three way. Villain bets the flop here as the open raiser who started with a short stack. So we're going to assume recreational player. I think this is a pretty easy call, although it's not far from a fold and multi-way. If this opponent was constructing properly here and was polarized enough, this could just be a fold already. I think in practice, Fisher a little bit too blasé about what they bet here and therefore nines. I don't really feel like going away yet, but I wouldn't really fault hero for a fold here either. The turn is the six of hearts, villain checks, and in a heads up pot here, you'd have the decision of whether to block bet for value and denial with this part of your range or whether to check back. These would be the only real sensible lines. However, because ranges are much tighter in the formerly three-way configuration, there was a third player in the pot here, your range is really strong on this node actually and nines is not far at all from the bottom of it. Okay, you do have hands like king jack, king queen with backdoor that you could bluff with here or ace eight or suited or something like that from time to time. So it's not that this hand is like the bottom of your range by any means. However, here's the thing. When you bet this turn here and we actually considered going for quite an interesting play, which was actually like bombing the turn. I actually said to my student in the session that he talked me round into me liking this idea basically because the idea is that when somebody bets half pot into three people and then checks this turn their over pairs are going to be a bound they're going to have a lot of those so your nines are going to have limited showdown value they'll have some but not loads and over pairs are going to feel very very sick on this turn if you imagine yourself having jacks or tens or queens or kings or aces here and you check to a guy that just called you in position in a three-way pot on the flop when you bet half pot and then they go ahead and over bet the turn or pot the turn or something. How are you going to feel with kings by the river? How often are you getting to showdown with that over pair? And how often are you protecting your turn checking range with the right number of sets to pair and things like that? Very infrequently, right? So I think in this spot, this is a really cool opportunity to just turn the hand into like a kind of kamikaze but awesome bluff where we basically say to villain, you're too capped here. Yes, I have some showdown value and you know, I have lower down hands in my range that I could bluff with. But because I think that you're overfolding here and you're not going to protect yourself, I'm going to turn stuff into a bluff, even though it has lots of showdown value. And we decided that betting that turn jamming river was a pretty cool line. After we don't bet the turn, you just have to check river now. The fold equity's fallen off a cliff. You're not going to get something like kings to fold at this juncture. Villain had six more suited. Should tell you all you need to know. The note there is open six more suited and hijack. And from that note, you can infer all kinds of stuff that make this guy likely to be whalish. On to pocket aces. We go for the three bet in the small blind. A lovely play. 
of course, a7-6. I think you can check here. I think you can bet small here. a7-6 is a board that really does polarize the opponent's range quite heavily. If you imagine that villain has hands like eights and fives and nines here that are very bad, and then hands like a6 or a set or a two pair that's very good. They have a pretty polarized range. You, on the other hand, have more mergy or condensed hands like kings, queens, or jacks that the opponent is going to have infrequently. Therefore, solvers are not going to bet super often here. They're going to bet small when they do bet because you don't really want to bet big or even bet that frequently into a range that's more polarized than your own. Yes, you can have ace-king in pocket aces and he can't, but he has sixes and sevens at a much higher frequency and less mediocre hands, making his range more polarized than yours. So we do end up going for the flop check here. We face this sizing, which is really interesting. We actually face the pot size bet. What would you do here? Would you raise or would you call? Before you answer the question, let me give you a clue. One line is abominably horrible and the other line is fine. So if you commit one line here, you're actually committing one of the biggest atrocities possible in poker and the other line is fine. Is this a call or is this a raise? Pause the video now. Unpause in three, two, one. That's right, of course this is a call. Raising here would be utterly ridiculous and the student being a solid professional winning player does not choose to raise. Turn is a jack, we checked the polarized pot sized better, who knows what the hell villain is doing here. They check back, the river is a jack, and this spot is a really, really easy check, of course. This is not a bet, this is a terrible betting spot. The idea is that you unblock the jack, which will bet anyway. So for any of you that are out there that are like, I'm going to value bet to target jack x, oh yes. Well, you need to take a good look in the mirror and you need to say to yourself, is this game for me? Is this game really for me? You're going to target Jack X by betting here? Really? What's wrong with that thought process? Well, if you check, that always bets. So why on earth do you need to target it by betting? Why would you want to target it anyway? Why would you want to deliberately put blinkers on yourself in a way where you're only looking at one part of villain's range at one time? That's really silly and just completely reckless and needless. So don't do that. Villain's range here is still polarized. They potted the flop. They may have hit a jack on the turn and then checked it back, but because that hand has skyrocketed up in the equity rankings to being nearly the nuts, Villain is going to bet that every single time. Villain doesn't have an ace here for two main reasons. One, they shouldn't really pot just a naked ace on the flop. And two, you block almost all of the ace x in the universe. Secondly, if Villain has sevens or sixes, again, you don't have to target that by checking, by betting. You can just check and it will value bet anyway and you will win all the money. So why do we check? Well, the idea is that there isn't really such a thing as a mediocre hand in Villain's range here. So they either have nothing and they can consider bluffing the river with King-10 or Queen-10 or 8-9 or 10-9 or a hand like this that gave up turn but now wants to reignite itself as a bluff or they're just going to be value betting anyway. So there's really just no reason to bet here. Not only is there no reason to bet, but betting this river is absolutely fucking atrocious it's like one of the worst things you could ever possibly do and like i say if you bet here you really need to go away and have a hard look at yourself and ask yourself am i even hand reading and am i even comparing the ev of one line to another man i feel like shredding the audience today i probably shouldn't do that it should be nicer it's okay guys you can work on it if you wanted to bet that river it's okay you can fix it we can fix this together keep watching carrot corner poker education and check out carrotcorner.com there's hope for you yet jacks open under the gun three bet by cutoff we go for the call here Looks like a, a pretty normal play. I think you can also mix in 4-bet here for a couple of reasons. One, you can deny equity to your opponent's range quite nicely with a 4-bet here. Two, you can get called by hands against which you're doing fine. And three, you don't have to suffer through the ordeal of seeing a flop with jacks because as we all know, jacks is a trouble hand and you should just fold it pre so you don't have to deal with all the pain it inflicts on you, right? Or so says the live 1-3 player. Not all of them. Not you. Not you watching this, but some of your... 1-3 colleagues. Anyway, ace-ace-9, we go for a check because that's what you do on boards that are absolutely horrendous for you. Villain goes for a bet and we're going to go for a call because there's just really nothing else to do here. We go for a call, the ace comes on the turn, we go for a check, they go for a bet. This is grim, right? So this is a really weird spot. So the GTO of this spot is kind of bizarre. If I remember rightly from yesterday, what happens here in GTO is that Villain is meant to pure give up with King Jack in my sim, but bet King Queen. Now you guys might be going, according to GTO wizard, that's not the case, Pete. And that's fine, because lots of sims are different to one another. They depend on inputs like stack size, they depend on inputs like starting range, bet size, game tree, solver, accuracy, etc. Solver algorithm. It doesn't mean there's only one pseudo-equilibrium strategy here. There are lots that are all like fairly good, although some will be a bit better than others. This is a spot where, in reality, 
I hate these blockers. In reality, I think humans are much more likely to bluff here if they're not that strong. And there are a lot of people in this particular pool that are decent. There's a lot of other regs that are weaker. It's kind of a mixed bag. But the players that aren't that strong, I think they're more likely to bet with Queen Jack, Jack 10 or King Jack than they are with King Queen, even though King Queen is the pure bluff here because it has two overcards to all pocket pairs, not just some of them. If villain has Jack 10, that has two overcards to, to very few pocket pairs compared with King Queen. So that whole being alive when called thing, that's quite important. It's not all about blockers, so villain should actually go for this bet with King Queen, but not King Jack, which makes Jacks a mixed call on the turn. This is the bluff catcher. Don't feel like you have to call here just because you have a boat. You're not playing baby poker anymore. You're not playing 2NL anymore. You can't just say full house is a good hand I call. That's not what it takes to be a good poker player. Stop doing that. That's really, really bad of you guys. You need to stop that right now. This is a mix, but I would probably fold in real life because I don't believe that people apply enough pressure here. I think this is an underbluff node, and this is a call I kind of disagree with my student on. Although maybe again, the student has a lot of reads on the people in pool, and it's very common during our conversations for me to say, not sure about your play here, and him say, well, this guy only has this range. And I'm like, well, I can't argue with that. So sometimes that's the way it goes. Villain goes for this sizing on the river, and I think at this point, it's kind of, again, a toss up. It doesn't really matter what you do. I think the student had a pretty good read here that the opponent was probably over betting with most of their ASX and doing this with too many bluffs, in which case they have an abominable leak and they should be exploited for that leak. Let's do one more hand. If you didn't see that showdown because that was a bit quick, we did actually get him on the river there. We ran into the King Queen, which is the GTO turn bluff. Villain did a good job of finding that. It's also a pretty decent river bluff as well with blockers to Ace King and Ace Queen, both of which can exist in hero's range on this node. All right, King Jack of Spades, go for an open last hand of the day, guys. Don't forget to like this video. If you like the format, tell me by pressing the like button. Tell me by leaving a comment and show me your love by subscribing. It doesn't cost you anything. And it means, of course, you'll get notified about everything like the 25% off-site wide sale that's going on at Carrot Corner this weekend from the 7th to the 11th of April. Do check that out if you're watching this in 2026. No, not this year, you bozo. I mean, three years ago, of course. Go for the call here. Standard play. Hands too good to 4-bet. It's too good to fold. It's too good to 4-bet bluff. It's too bad to 4-bet for value. It's just the call. Slam dunk call region. We get through the small c-bet here and we go for the peel. Deuce of clubs on the turn. Big c-bet. Pure call. Nothing to say. This is a river spot some of you will get wrong. This, this spot to my student and to me is like a complete no-brainer. It's like a really, really silly, trivial spot. But for you, it may not be. And don't take that the wrong way, guys, but it might not be. The thing is on this river, some of you check back. And some of you check back because you're scared and you're like, well, I can't get called by anything. But that's actually not true. Because villain can have things like king 10, they can have things like queens, and they can have hit the nine on the river that gives them a bluff catcher. It's very plausible here that you have about 92% equity. In fact, if villain has ace king or 6x or a boat or aces or something like that, they really shouldn't be checking the river to your really condensed range. They should be jamming. So in GTO, this is a pure shove. And if you play this spot against anyone with half a brain, you should definitely jam for value. However, if you play this spot against someone with less than half a brain, which is most of the people at 10 NL, then you should probably check because they'll just randomly show up with like aces here. Although it depends on the player. I don't want to advocate like this huge deviation of not jamming here because that would be so bad against a competent player that you really need to know that your opponent's a super net that's going to like check all aces against you in the river for no reason before you check back here. So lovely shove. We do get paid off this time by queens, which can double barrel and then check all river. This is definitely kind of GTO-ish line by both players here. You'll note that this hand blocks king-queen, which is our main value region, and also unblocks just about every bluff we can have because while well, we call the flop and a turn with things like diamond-diamond, we don't do that with spade-spade or heart-heart or offsuit cards with a spade and a heart. So the queens are nice blockers here and that they unblock our bluffs. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I will make loads more of these. Don't forget to check out CarrotCorner.com this weekend for our Easter sale. And I will see you back here for more of this content very soon. Bye for now, guys.